I am delighted at this opportunity to welcome you to the first Pan-African Parliament Dialogue with Civil Society. Undeniably, Civil Society is an indispensable partner in a true representative democracy and remains an integral part of any meaningful dialogue on poverty and innovation initiatives and the Millennium Development Goals. The Pan-African Parliament remains a platform for African people and their grassroots organizations to make an input into the decision-making process on the challenges and problems facing our continent. Article 3 of the same protocol requires the Pan-African Parliament, amongst other things, to facilitate the effective implementation of African Union policies, familiarize the peoples of Africa with objectives and policies aimed at integrating the African continent within the framework of the establishment of the African Union, strengthen continental solidarity, and build a common destiny amongst African people. It is therefore important for us to work together in policy formulation processes so that through exchange of information, we can develop those policies that are responsive to our people's needs. The role of civil society to provide impartial, specific, and balanced information to the public about the actions and sometimes inactions of both parliament and executive arms of government and where applicable provide constructive criticisms on the way parliamentarians perform their functions. We welcome the scrutiny of the civil society organizations and we invite both academic and non-governmental organizations tracking issues on governance, human rights, peace and security, gender equality, trade, environmental issues, health, education, and agriculture and food security to work closely with us on our major thematic areas in which we have established committees. We believe that this constructive engagement will strengthen our parliamentary strategic programs and ensure its proper alignment with the public need. I believe that it's equally important to explore other continental indirect avenues of addressing poverty education such as the boosting of intra-African trade and enhanced utilization of Africa's abundant natural resources. These natural resources abundant in Africa represent an important asset and a potential wealth for our poor people and their communities. Because these natural resources are renewable, if properly managed, this wealth can provide long-term economic growth that will be instrumental in bringing us closer towards achieving Millennium Development Goals. And we believe that the low level of intra-African trade is a missed growth and development opportunity. According to the World Trade Organization, today intra-African trade remains very low and stands at around about 12%. Recent studies have indicated that if only African countries can increase their share of global trade by just 2%, this, will re this would represent an additional annual income for the continent of over $100 billion. We must begin to develop a framework for consistent and sustainable management of Africa's natural resources and establish a formidable mechanism for harvesting and ensuring equitable distribution of these resources in a manner that will eradicate poverty and bring prosperity to our people. In the year 2000, world leaders made a commitment to eradicate poverty by setting clear targets, the MDGs, to be achieved by 2015. And as this date approaches, it is now time to evaluate and decide on what the future holds for over one billion African citizens. Enormous progress has been made towards achieving the MDGs. Global poverty continues to decline. Access to safe water, drinking water has been greatly expanded. 40, more, 40 million more children are attending schools. Close to 4 million children who are living 
would otherwise have died. And more than 200,000 people are alive who before would have died from malaria. And an estimated 5.2 million people in low and middle income countries are now receiving life saving HIV treatment. Education for our children on the continent remains a major issue. Close to 45 million children of school age across our continent are not receiving any formal education whatsoever. And we think that a lot more needs to be done to increase access to basic education for our children. A child without an education in today's world has very little chances of succeeding. So it behaves on us to pursue legislations that will ensure that governments fund basic education. According to UN projections, in 2015, almost 1 billion people will be living in extreme poverty on less than $1.25 a day. Continuing gaps on poverty, hunger, health, gender equality, water, sanitation, and many issues will still need attention after 2015. Therefore, accelerating MDG progress and preparing for post-2015 UN development framework are part and parcel of the effort that we must make now. Several challenges remain unresolved. There is inequality in the spread of wealth in our societies. So the statistics on paper shows improved economic activity. More oil has been drilled from the ground, higher crude oil prices in the market, more gas has been exported, more income has come into the national process, economy, and yet there's inequality in the distribution of this wealth. The poor have gotten poorer. Food prices are rising in our communities. They have less access to health care, which remains in private hands if you want quality health care. The government hospitals are without drugs, and the qualified doctors have moved to the private service. We must find ways to ensure that these statistics of economic growth affect the real people who need it. The political crisis and the uprisings that we're seeing in various African countries are out of frustration that a generation of young people whose future has been left without being attended to are rising and saying enough is enough. And there's need for us as parliamentarians to focus on these issues, to deal with the real life issues, and to find solutions to hold our governments accountable, to insist on transparent use of available resources. We believe that this charter provides a platform to give the continent common values on democracy common interpretation on electoral processes, on good governance. We are convinced that a lot of the crises in various African countries are an outcome of the governance process, where there is disagreement over the outcome of elections, where there is disagreement over seat-tight rulers, where there is disagreement and discontent in the political space being provided for all parties to play, this turns to civil dissatisfaction, civil strife, and turns to civil war. So we think that political stability is essential, and this must be done within a legal framework. And this charter provides that framework for free association of political parties 
freedom to form political parties, independent electoral commissions, truly independent to oversee electoral processes, an independent judiciary to interpret the laws and the regulations for elections. And more importantly, the Charter also provides for the most vulnerable sectors of our society, the minority groups, our women, our children, who are most vulnerable when we have this civil crisis. This very important Charter also provides for the freedom of the media, freedom of information. And on issues of governance, it is very clear that the government has a responsibility to provide basic social services to its citizens. It holds governments accountable to utilize available resources in a transparent manner. Ladies and gentlemen, on the 15th of January 2012, this charter came into force because we received the required 15 ratifications. But this is not enough. We must continue the campaign to ensure that every member state of the African Union ratifies this charter. We must continue the campaign to ensure that every National Assembly domesticates this charter. We must continue the campaign to ensure that this charter is implemented across the board. The process of integration can only happen effectively if we share common values. This charter on public service is important because while we still hold our leaders and our political leaders accountable for the misuse of our resources, we believe that the civil service and the public service have a very important role to play. They are not outside the process of corruption on our continent. In fact, if the civil servants hold dearly the civil service public rules of accountability and transparency we would be able to reduce corruption. The Secretary General's high-level panel on post-2015 is working to prepare a bold yet practical development vision to present to the Secretary General for his report to be considered by the UN Member States in September 2013. It is our belief that through a modest provision, this meeting will serve to listen to the voices of civil society to highlight what in our view are critical issues on governance that should be included in the post-2015 development framework. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very fruitful deliberation and I hope that we build a closer relationship and that the goals of this meeting will be achieved and that the people of Africa will be better off from the outcome of this very important deliberation. I thank you and God bless you.